بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so إن شاء الله we'll continue from where we had left off last time and uh, today إن شاء الله we are starting uh, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam Zubayr ibn al-Awwam uh, the uh, sixth companion or the sixth companion out of the ten that we are doing and Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiyallahu ta'ala an as usual we begin with his nasab with his lineage uh, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam radiyallahu ta'ala an was related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from multiple ways first and foremost from his father's side from his father's side he links with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the fifth generation and that is Qusay from the fifth generation and that is Qusay so after Ali ibn Abi Talib him and Uthman are both five generations from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and from his mother's side he is actually one of the closest to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because even though of course his father is al-awwam his mother is Safiya the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. So Safiya is of course the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. So Zubayr is the first cousin. Zubayr is the first cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Safiya, by the way, she had married uh, uh, a person by the name of uh, Al-Harith ibn Harb, the older brother of Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, his older brother is Harith. Harith died in the days of Jahiliyyah. They didn't have any children. So then she married uh, Awam uh, ibn Khuwaylid. So Awam, then Zubayr ibn Awam is their son. So this is so far two relationships. The Prophet ﷺ through the father, five generations Qusay. The Prophet ﷺ's aunt Safiya, so Zubayr becomes the first cousin. Then there's a third relationship. The third relationship is Khadija binti Khuwaylid's brother is Awam ibn Khuwaylid. And Awam is Zubayr ibn Awam. So Khadija also becomes the aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Khadija becomes the aunt of Zubayr ibn Awam. You're correct, yes. And the Prophet becomes a type of uncle then, meaning through the marriage, right? Khadija is married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he becomes the uncle indirectly, not by blood, by marriage, right? So the Prophet is related to Zubayr through the father, and through the mother, and through a uh, Khadija. And uh, by the way, Khadija, we might as well just quickly mention the story of, uh, of uh, Safiya, uh, not Khadija, Safiya, because Safiya, we're not going to have an entire class dedicated to uh, Safiya, and there's only a few tidbits we, we have anyway about Safiya. So we might as well just mention Safiya, the mother of uh, Zubayr ibn Awam, that Safiya is the most famous aunt of the Prophet The most famous aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she is also the full brother of Hamza. So Hamza and Safiya are full brothers and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had six aunts. He had six aunts. Out of these six, the one we know for sure who embraced Islam is Safiya. Okay? That one for sure she embraced Islam. Did any other aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam embrace Islam? There's ikhtilaf. One of them, inshallah, it seems one more embraced Islam, and her name was Arwa. Her name was Arwa binti Abdul Muttalib. And then a third one, there's some controversy, and it appears she lived to see Islam, but she didn't quite embrace it. And that is Atika. Who is Atika? Who can remind me what, what is the story of Atika? We covered it a long time ago. Atika. Atika was the one who saw the dream in the Battle of Badr of a rock coming down the mountain and splitting up and pebbles going into every single house. This is Atika, right? So Atika, there's no evidence that she accepted Islam. There's no evidence that she accepted Islam. So from what we know for sure, Safiya was the first and definitely the most prominent aunt of the process to convert. Arwa most likely also converted and she died an early death. And most likely, these are the only two aunts of the Prophet ﷺ who converted. And uh, the fact that Safiya was one of the most beloved aunts, and so Safiya is the mother of Zubayr, the fact that Safiya was one of the most beloved aunts is demonstrated by the hadith in Sahih Bukhari that when the Prophet ﷺ first began preaching Islam, when he first began preaching, uh, he uh, gave his famous sermon and khutbah, and at the end of it, he said, O Fatima binti Abdul Muttalib, O Safiya. Oh, oh, Fatima uh, binti Muhammad, oh, Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib, I cannot help you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will have to save yourselves from the fire, from the punishment. So he mentioned by name his daughter Fatima. 
even though there were other daughters alive, but Fatima is of course the youngest, so she has that special place. And out of all of the other aunts and uncles, he mentions Safiya. Why? Because he's showing the Quraysh that, O oh Quraysh, the fact that I love my daughter and my aunt will not save them from the punishment of Allah on the Day of Judgment unless they accept Islam and unless they convert. So the fact that he mentions Safiya by name, and the only aunt that is mentioned as Safiya, in fact the only person of that generation is mentioned as Safiya, shows that the Prophet ﷺ had a very close relationship with Safiya. And in fact, Safiya was born roughly the same year either a few months before or after the Prophet ﷺ, essentially in the same Amul Fil. So Safiya's age and the Prophet ﷺ's age is similar. Now of course you know that uh, Abdul Muttalib married multiple, multiple um, uh, wives. And so a number of uncles and aunts of the Prophet ﷺ are actually similar to him in age. Maybe a year or two older like Hamza was similar to him in age, just two years older, year and a half older. And then after Hamza was Safiya. Safiya was younger than Hamza. So Safiya and the Prophet ﷺ were of a similar age. Now, the only things we know about Safiya in the entire seerah are two very significant incidents. Two very interesting incidents. These are the only two incidents that we know about Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. The first of them deals with uh, the Battle of Uhud. The Battle of Uhud, in which after the Battle of Uhud, uh, when the uh, body of Hamza was discovered and it was mutilated, we know all the story, remember, the Battle of Uhud, the body of Hamza is mutilated, and before they had buried Hamza, all of a sudden in the distance they see Safiya coming from Medina to see Hamza's body. And the Prophet ﷺ saw her in the distance on the battlefield, and she was the only lady, the only lady, and she said, Al-mar'a, al-mar'a, yani, the woman's coming, meaning my aunt. Stop her from coming. Why is the Prophet I'm saying to stop Safiya from coming? Why? He wants to protect Safiya from seeing the body of Hamza, right? And uh, so when he's saying stop the woman, stop the woman, Zubair stands up, it's his mother. Zubair stands up and rushes forward. And he stands in front of his mother. Now this is his mother, right? His mother pushes him aside. Get out of here. I'm going to go see. And Zubair says, the Prophet has stopped you. Now she stops. SubhanAllah, look. The son can stop the mother, but not the Prophet right? So she says, the Prophet is forbidding you. And she is, in the end of the day, a Muslim. She must submit, but she's also an aunt. So she says, is he forbidding me because he thinks I cannot see the body of Hamza? For by Allah, I know that they have mutilated his body and I have come to see and I know he is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I have brought his kafan for him. So she has demonstrating now that she has the taqwa and sabr that is needed. And so when the Prophet ﷺ saw that she has that much himma, taqa, sabr, quwa, so he gave the ishara to go. And so Safiya went to the body of Hamza and she had the, the kafan. And if you remember the story, next to Hamza was an Ansari who had no money whatsoever. And Safiya had brought in two nice cloths, right? And so they ended up de donating one of the cloths to the Ansari and one of the cloths was for Hamza. So this incident is one of the famous incidents of Safiya because it demonstrates uh, regarding Safiya, it demonstrates her Iman, her Taqwa, her resolve. And the even more interesting story is the story that took place in the Ghazwat al-Khandaq, the, the story of the, the trench in which if you remember the story of the Khandaq, when at the very uh, middle or if you like when it was clear that the Muslims are pretty much surrounded by the Ahzab on the outside and the uh, Banu Qaridah on the inside. That there is the possibility of revolt. There's a possibility that there's going to be an attack from the inside. So the Prophet ﷺ told all of the women and children of the city to go to a particular fortress on the mountaintop. To go to a particular fortress on the mountaintop and to just stay there to be protected. But he didn't have men to guard the fortress because every man was in the front of the battlefield. Every man was in the front of the battlefield. And uh, therefore all the women and children are, and there were one or two very elderly men, you know, like the infirm, you know, 80 year old, 9 year old that have no power, they were there. 
and the only relatively young man was Hassan ibn Thabit. And why was Hassan ibn Thabit in uh, that fortress? Because it's rather awkward to say this, but people, Allah created people differently, and not everybody has the same capacities as others. And Hassan ibn Thabit was an artist, he was a poet, right? And even to this day, poets typically, artists typically, they are not the ones that exude physical strength and courage, typically. And Hassan was well known that he was not able to essentially fight. He was just not capable emotionally, not physically, he's a man, but I mean, some people are simply not equipped emotionally. And this is an awkward thing to say, but the fact of the matter is, this is the khalq Allah Azza wa Jal. Some people are different. Not everybody can be in the battlefield. And Hassan was well known that essentially he was not able to carry a sword and meet an enemy. He would start trembling and not be able to, to fight, right? You understand the point here. And by the way, it's an interesting tangent here that I've, I mentioned when I talk, talk about this incident, that the fact that Hassan ibn Thabit was of this nature, and even more awkward, his role in the slander of Aisha that Allah forgave, that Allah forgave. Still, his role in the Ummah was second to none when it came to what he was good at. In other words, even though he wasn't at all a fighter, even though he's not known for narrating hadith, he's not known for fiqh, He's not known for ijtihad and fatawa. What he was good at, nobody else could compete with him. And what was he good at? Poetry, Poetry shi'r, Islamic. right? He is the father of the shu'ara of the Sahaba, right? He is the greatest of the shu'ara of the time of the Sahaba, such that when the Prophet wanted poetry to be written, he would command, Qum ya Hassan. Stand up, Hassan, and go respond to the Quraysh, right? Go respond to the Quraysh. And Jibreel is with you. Jibreel is going to help you. Now, I mentioned this, even though it's awkward to say, but if Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala an has certain areas that he's not strong at, yet that's irrelevant because despite those weaknesses, what he is good at, he excelled. So then all of us, we have our weaknesses. All of us, we have our weak points. But inshallah, we also have strengths that we can give to the ummah. So the point with Hassan's story is a bit of a tangent. Don't let the weaknesses hold you back because of your strengths, right? Don't let the guilt complex, you know, I'm not good in qira'ah, I'm not good in this, or I have this sin, for example, right? Hassan ibn Thabit was not defined by one mistake he made in the Qissat al-Ifq. His whole life was not defined by that one slip that he did. Allah forgave him. And khalas, life goes on. He repented from that. And he then had to do what he had to do. And he wasn't, as we said, even in this, this regard, he wasn't on the forefront. So his lack of being able to participate is so well known that essentially he is the only able-bodied man put inside the fortress with the women and children. Okay, and the extremely old people, you know, those that are simply physically, they're not able to. Now, they're in the, the, the qil'a, they're in the fortress, and all of a sudden they hear two of the uh, Banu Quraydah at the bottom of, the, at the, bottom of the, 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 the mountain, beginning to climb up. It's the middle of the night, it's dead silent, you can hear people climbing up. And they're whispering to themselves, is there any guard? Is there anything that's there? Uh, if there's no guard, we can send a larger group and we can execute all of them. Because remember, the Banu Qurayla, what happened with them in the uh, or the incident of Ahzab, they flipped sides, right? Yeah. They flipped sides, they became traitors. And they were willing to kill the women and children. So the punishment that came to them, they deserved it. There's no question about it. So now they're sending in spies to see if the qil'a, if the fortress is guarded or not. And the people in the fortress are now terrified that what, who is outside, what not. So Safiya turns to Hassan and says, Hassan, go defend us. You're the man here, go defend. He's the only man there. 
And Hassan is not able to. He's not able to. He's not simply, that's not in his mizaj. And as I said, we don't say anything other than khair. Everybody's different. Wallahi, everybody's different. We all have our, our issues and what. He's simply not able to go down and defend at this time. So, Safiya grabs the only dagger that they have. They have no armed men with them because all the men are worried about the Quraysh outside. She grabs the only dagger, Khinjar, yeah, and she puts it in her mouth. And she then climbs over the fortress wall in the middle of the night. And she sees the two men climbing up. So she hides behind a rock. And when one of them reaches her place, immediately she stabs him multiple times. And cuts the head off and throws it down to the other man who's still climbing up. And the other man is terrified and he thinks that there's a whole group of people there and he comes back down yelling to the people they have guards they have guards like they have people guarding them and so the Banu Qurayla disappear okay and Safiya then uh, goes back up with the bloodied khinjar the bloodied knight uh, the dagger and uh, says to Hassan that okay I killed him for you can you get his sword and his armor because you know in those days by now you know, we've done so many lectures, this is money, this is important. This is like a sword and an armor can last you 10 years, 20 years. This is like wealth, right? And Hassan ibn Thabit says, La haja that I don't need any sword and armor, thanks. Now, of course, why didn't Safiya get it? Why didn't Safiya get it? She did not want to undress a man. Okay, she did not want to undress a man. She says, Haya, look, look, I'm a woman, I'm not going to take his clothes off. So he goes to Hassan, I killed him for you, can you go get his weapons and his armor? La haja li fi dalik. I don't need any, any of that, you know, I don't, you can let him rot over there. But here again we see uh, the bravery of Safiya. So subhanAllah, if this is the mother, what do you think will be the son? That's what we're talking about today. If this is the mother, then where do you think the son is going to come uh, from this? And Safiya, by the way, she passed away uh, in the Khilaf of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So she lived after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And she passed away at the age of 73. The Prophet ﷺ passed away 63. She passed away at 73 and around 20 year of the Hijrah. And she is buried in Baqi'ah. And to this day, her Qabr is well known for the men, even the women. You can see it, but you really can't see it exactly. When the men, when you come inside the Baqi'ah, when you come inside and you see the Al Al Bayt right in front of you to the right, turn around, uh, basically, so if that's 12 o'clock when you enter, turn around to, it would essentially be 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, like you turn all the way that away, 7 o'clock. And you look towards the corner and you will see a little bit of a raised structure, that is Safiya. So Safiya's grave is actually next to the Jidar, next to the wall. And uh, if the women walk up to it, they're right next to it, but they're not going to be able to look inside because the wall is too high. But essentially, when you enter the Qabr, it's literally uh, 20 meters at 7 o'clock. Just the other way backwards, you look there and there's going to be Safiyas over there. Uh, so she is buried inside Baqi al Gharqada, and her grave is uh, well known. Now, um, Zubair, we get back to Zubair. Zubair is the, 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 the person that we're interested in. Zubair ibn Awam, he had a, a three brothers, so there are a total of four brothers. A total of four brothers. And we do not know of any sisters. So a total of four brothers. One of them <clears throat> died in Kufr, fighting against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. <clears throat> the worst death imaginable. One of them died on the wrong side. So he died on the side of the Quraysh, uh, Abu Lahab. Uh, another of them fought in Badr, but he was not captured, and he returned to Mecca, and he then converted to Islam at the conquest of Mecca. So Alhamdulillah, he converted at the end. Okay, and a third, the third one, converted uh, at some time in uh, late Meccan phase. So he also then is of the Sahaba, but he didn't convert as early as Zubair. And the third one, which is the most famous after Zubair, is As-Sa'ib ibn al-Awwam. As-Sa'ib ibn al-Awwam. And As-Sa'ib ibn al-Awwam, he died a shaheed, fighting in the wars of Ridda uh, against Musaylama. Against Musaylama. So he became a Muslim, but not as early as 
Zubair, and he eventually died a uh, shaheed. Now, uh, Zubair ibn Awam, we have a few narrations about how he looked. His sons and grandsons described him. We know that he was extremely tall, one of the tallest of the Sahaba. It is said that when he rode on a horse, his feet almost dragged on the ground if there was no saddle. That's a huge... So maybe, you know, I don't know, six foot seven, something like that. I mean, a very tall man, a way above average for the Quraysh standard, like a relatively tall person. Also, he was wiry, like, you know, thin and, you know, not, not, not naif, not like thin, but, you know, you know they were wiry, like muscular thin, not thin that is weak thin. He's muscular, but he's thin. He's not broad shoulder. You know those types of people that are, you can tell they're athletic. You can tell they're very energetic. And they have no weight. They have no extra. Like Ali was short and stocky. That's a different type of strength, right? Zubayr ibn Awam is tall and his, his muscle is on the bones everywhere. So he's a muscular, yet it's wiry. He's a very athletic, uh, agile, if you like, uh, person. His skin was darkish brown. His skin was darkish brown. And his beard was sparse. It wasn't the huge, thick one like Umar Ali. It was a, a sparse beard. Towards the end of his life, when it became white, he chose not to dye it. So he had a full white beard. He did not want to uh, dye it towards the end of his life. Uh, and um, Zubayr ibn Awam as well, uh, his body was covered with scars by the time of his death. According to some reports, he had over 70 wounds and scars from top to bottom. So he is one of the warrior Sahaba, like Khalid ibn al-Walid, but except earlier than Khalid. So he's one of the Sahaba who excelled in battles, as we will see. And a number of his scars were extremely prominent, as we'll mention in a while. Uh, Zubair's father, Awam, died before Zubair was born, uh, or at a very young age, one of the two. Either Zubair was a toddler or whatnot, so essentially Zubair grows up an orphan. Zubair grows up an orphan, and perhaps this caused his mother to be extra strict with him. So uh, Ibn Ishaq mentions the story, and Ibn Sa'd in his tabaqati mentions that. Uh, once when Zubair was a child, uh, Safiya uh, became irritated at something, like all mothers do, and she began beating Zubair. And Zubair's uncle from his father's side, who had kind of adopted financially, like I'm going to take care of the kid. He heard the beating. So he came to tell Safiya, stop beating the kid, because that's now he feels responsible, right? Stop beating Zubair. You're beating him as if you hate him. Don't you love your child? You can't, how can you beat him like this? And uh, Safiya responded back uh, in beautiful lines of poetry, uh, which of course, I mean, can you imagine a mother is angry and yet she's spouting poetry. Those are different times, right? Even when she's rebuking the child and somebody comes in between, she versifies poetry. And she basically says that, and the translation is, whoever says I hate him is a liar, meaning you're a liar. I'm hitting him so that he may respond in battle, so that he may re reply back in battle. And he may vanquish the army and come back with booty and so that his money may not be taken from him. In other words, he is saying, this is the love of a mother. I'm hitting him to be strong. Don't say that I don't love him. This is my way, tough love, motherly love, if you like. Uh, Zubayr ibn Awam was around 11, 12 years old when the Prophet ﷺ began his da'wah. And he was of the first batch of converts. Remember, all of the Ashra and Mubashara, they're the first batch, right? That's why they're Ashra Abu Bashara. All of the Ashra Abu Bashara are of the first batch. And Zubair was of the five people whom Abu Bakr converted basically within two, three days. As soon as Abu Bakr converts to Islam, within a few days, five major Sahaba convert. And of them is a Zubair ibn Awam. Okay? Zubair ibn Awam is of those initial converts at the hands of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. We mentioned them last week with Talha and Ali and all of them. Uthman. Sorry, not Ali. Ali is directly. But Talha and Uthman and others, they convert directly at the hand of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And he is probably at the time not more than 12 years old. So not more than 12 years old. And he converts to Islam, and he becomes a regular at Darul Arqam, and he is one of the youngest of the private attendees at Darul Arqam. And eventually, when Islam goes public, and he is allowed to inform his family, uh, when his family finds out, the same uncle that criticized Safiya for beating him, takes him to torture him. Okay? So, the same uncle who didn't want Zubair to be beaten for whatever trivial thing, now that he's accepted Islam, 
that's crossing the line that he cannot do. And so he takes Zubayr ibn Awam and he uh, puts him into a room with no window, no nothing, and he lights a fire outside to not to burn him, but so that the smoke is now in the room, so he cannot breathe. And he keeps him there, and he tells him, until you leave Islam. Okay, so this is a torture technique, a very bad torture technique, where I'm sure the heat also affected him, but the main point is the smoke, that there's no air in. And as Zubayr remained there, and he kept on saying, Wallahi la akfuru abadan, I'm never going to go back to kufr. Yani I'm never going to go back to kufr. And he kept on saying this, and we don't know how long that the uncle kept in there, but when Zubair did not give up, then the uncle let him go after this and uh, understood that he's not going to uh, reject Islam. Uh, so Zubair was persecuted uh, in a manner that we would say is, call it however torture, it wasn't the type of torture that Bilal got, but different types of torture are there. And this was a torture that uh, dealt with basically the breathing and the, and the smoke and whatnot. And he was put there for a while. And Allah knows best after was what happened. What we do know is eventually he did leave Mecca to Abyssinia. So he was one of those few of the Quraysh who migrated to Abyssinia and then migrated to Medina. So he is Sahibul Hijratain. He is the one who did Hijrah two times. Now one of the uh, blessings of Zubair as well, one of the blessings of Zubair is that Zubair was the very first Muslim to unsheathe a sword for the sake of Allah fi sabilillah, to defend Islam. So Zubair has the honor of unsheathing a sword. The first time where a sword is taken out in order to defend Islam. And this occurred in early Mecca. Ibn Sa'ad mentions in his Tabaqat, one of the earliest books of Sirah, that once news spread incorrectly that the Prophet has been kidnapped or killed. Incorrect news in Mecca. This is early Mecca. And so Zubair heard this news. And he immediately rushed out with his sword unsheathed into the streets of Mecca. Now this is very dangerous because even in modern America, if you have your gun out in the streets, that's a sign and people can do something to you. So Zubayr is rushing back and forth trying to find the Prophet Sallallahu And eventually when he does find him in some valley, the Prophet said, what is this sword? What are you doing? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I heard that somebody had taken you or even killed you. So the Prophet said, what would you do with this sword? He said, I would have killed him back. And at this stage, he's probably 14, 15 years old. 15 years old, max, maybe 14. We don't know the exact date these are occurring, right? But this is early Mecca. And Zubayr is already now brandishing his sword and saying, I would have basically defended you and killed him back. And so the Prophet had made dua for him and for his sword. He made dua for him and for his sword, meaning for his fighting. And this dua is going to come in handy with Zubair throughout his, his life. Uh, it is also mentioned that in this early stage, the Prophet ﷺ made mu'akha, you know the brotherhood? Remember we said the mu'akha took place in Mecca and in Medina, both. So in Mecca, Zubair was made the brother of Talha. And so Talha and Zubair, we, we did Talha last week. Talha and Zubair, عنهم, they always were very close. One of the reasons is because of this. That Talha and Zubair became the brothers in early uh, Mecca. So, uh, Zubair radiallahu an, what we know about him in this stage of Mecca uh, is that, as we said, he's one of the very few people who migrated uh, from the elite of the Quraysh to Abyssinia. And one of the extremely rare Sahaba who we actually have a story from in Abyssinia. In Abyssinia, even though the Sahaba lived there, some of them, they lived there for almost a decade, like Ja'far. The fact of the matter is we have hardly anything in the books of Sirah, just a little bit of tidbits. And Zubair, uh, we have one incident from him in Abyssinia, one incident. And this is mentioned in Ibn Kathir, that when uh, Umm Salama and others had migrated to Abyssinia, Umm Salama narrates the story. Umm Salama is the main narrator in most of the Abyssinian incidents is Umm Salama. Uh, Umm Salama is of course eventually our mother. At this time, she hasn't, of course, she's married to Abu Salama. Eventually she marries the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she is the main narrator of anything happening in Abyssinia. So Umm Salama narrates that in the time of Najashi in Abyssinia, there was a coup. Pause here, footnote, we talked about this when we talked about Najashi. Najashi's nephew had overthrown his uncle. And there was an internal coup. And there was now a civil war going on in Abyssinia between 
Najashi who had been overthrown and his nephew who had taken the throne. So now there's a civil war going on. Okay? And Umm Salama said that we were the most worried and terrified since we had arrived in Abyssinia. Why? Because they knew that if the other guy came, in fact, maybe even their lives and property are gone because who's going to protect them? They have money. Not a lot, but still they have money. They have property. They have animals. They would literally be at the mercy of somebody who had no covenant or treaty with them. And perhaps, I mean, we're reading in here, we're reading in here, but the fact that Umm Salama is saying the Muslims had never been so terrified demonstrates that they knew that the nephew was an evil person. Okay? They knew the nephew would not give any rights to the Muslims. Unlike the Najashi who had of course given all the rights to the uh, Muslims. So she said, we spent the worst night in Abyssinia before the civil war, before the big war. The next morning, we said, who will check on the battle who's winning? Because if the other side is winning, we need to move out. Who's going to check who's winning? So Zubair volunteered to go check on who is winning. And what is the tactic he devised? He decided to swim up the Red Sea, because it's the Red Sea, you know, the Abyssinia, right? To swim up the Red Sea and to go to the area where the battle was taking place and to observe from the water. Because he cannot walk into the battlefield, he cannot walk onto the army. So he's going to go from the Red Sea and observe the battle. And subhanAllah, I found this very interesting that it mentions that so they devised for him a leather pouch full of air. What are they doing? Diving suits? No, he's not going to go diving. A lifeboat, a buoy, something like that, you know, just to hold on so he doesn't drown. So subhanAllah, look at the ingenuity of the Sahaba. So they gave him like a leather container, filled it with air and they tied it up, right? So he can basically hold on. So he used this to go up and to monitor the situation, and then he comes back and he says, Abshir, I give you good news that Najashi has won. So look at the bravery of Zubair to go and monitor the, 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 the battle from the ocean, and then to come back and then say, Alhamdulillah, Najashi has won. And of course, Najashi had uh, won. Um, and when the news spread that the, 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 the Quraysh had converted to Islam, remember the story of the satanic verse, we went over this, right? When the news spread that the Quraysh had converted to Islam, so then a lot of the uh, Abyssinian Muslims returned, Zubair was amongst them. So he was only in Abyssinia for maybe six, seven months, and then when he came back, he did not go back again. Remember, most of them went back again and they took more people. Zubair went back, he's like, I don't want to stay there, I want to stay in Mecca. So Zubair came back to Mecca and he remained in uh, Mecca until uh, the Hijrah, until the Hijrah. And I didn't find any narration between this to the Hijrah of anything happening to him. During this interim, he marries Asma binti Abi Bakr. Asma binti Abi Bakr. He marries Asma binti Abi Bakr and Asma is, of course, his uh, first wife and uh, the woman who will give him most of his children, including the two most famous sons that he will have. And these sons, you should know, he had plenty of sons, he had almost 20 children. But the most famous sons that everyone should know is Abdullah ibn Zubair and Urwa ibn Zubair. Okay? These two are names that should be embedded in every person's mind. Every student of Islamic knowledge, every student of history should know these names, Abdullah ibn Zubair and Urwa ibn Zubair, and between the two of them is more than 20-25 years. Abdullah is a Sahabi, Urwa is not a Sahabi. Abdullah is a Sahabi, Urwa is a Tabi'i. Okay, Urwa never saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's born after uh, the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, in any case, Asma is the mother of Abdullah and Urwa. Uh, and that's why the main narrator from Aisha, this is a hadith point, the main narrator from our mother Aisha, is Urwa. And Urwa from Aisha is one of the main isnads that we get to Aisha because Urwa is who? Her nephew, right? Urwa is her nephew. So Urwa is one of the very few human beings that can see Aisha without a hijab. And he would walk in and 
take hadith from Aisha and then because this is his aunt. This is his aunt. So Urwa is the main narrator from uh, Aisha and his son Hisham is the main narrator from Urwa and Imam Malik is a student of Hisham. So one of the golden chains of hadith, one of the most authentic golden chains, Malik, Hisham and Urwa and Aisha. Okay, Hisham ibn Urwa and then Urwa to Aisha. This is one of the golden chains, one of the top levels of Isnad, and you find this chain in Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi, of course in Muta Imam Malik, this is one of the main sources of our religion. Malik from Hisham, Hisham from his father, his father from his aunt Aisha. So uh, Asma bin Tabi Bakr uh, gets married to uh, Zubair, and uh, of course Asma then uh, becomes pregnant with Abdullah. While she is pregnant, the Hijrah takes place. So as a pregnant lady, Asma becomes involved in the Hijrah. What does Asma do in the Hijrah? Who can remind me? Oh, yeah. That and Nitaqain, which what does she do? Food, food, food logistics, water. food and water. Yeah. So in her pregnancy, and subhanAllah, what a blessed baby this will be, that this is the baby in her womb that is now helping in the Hijrah. Right? This is Abdullah ibn Zubair. Right, that this is the baby that is carrying his mother is carrying milk and dates to Abu Bakr and the Prophet on a daily basis. Remember, you know the plot. Remember that every day uh, at some time she would come, and then her brother Abdul Rahman would come behind her and carry take the flock of sheep and just get rid of all of the footsteps and whatnot. There was a very uh, sophisticated plan, so an Asma, she would not be monitored because, you know, she's a pregnant lady and who, who's going to monitor her. So she's the one who's bringing food to the Prophet Sallallahu and in her stomach at that time is Abdullah ibn Zubair. So what's going to happen with this young man? A lot is going to happen. We're going to have another class about Abdullah ibn Zubair, inshallah, in a few weeks. That is one of the most intriguing plots and twists of the seerah in his life and his political dominion and he fought against the Umayyads, the whole different uh, and a sad tragedy of a death as well uh, of Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Zubair, not the father Zubair. Zubair, we're talking about Zubair today. So this is Asma, his wife, that she's pregnant with Abdullah. Eventually, of course, the process arrives in Medina, safe and sound. So then Zubair and his wife Asma make the hijrah. Okay, so Zubair and Asma perform the hijrah and she is now in her final trimester. So she's now performing the hijrah, walking to Medina, pregnant with child, and she falls into labor before reaching Medina. And so Abdullah is delivered in Quba before they get to the city of Medina. Abdullah ibn Zubair is born in Quba, and his birth was considered to be one of the happiest omens for the early Muslims. Because the Muslims were, the, the Quraysh had basically spread a rumor that now that you're leaving Mecca and this is your homeland, this is where you're supposed to be, you will not be blessed. Now this is not, you know, evil people, they're just putting their, their, their curses, their hexes on them, right? You're not going to have children, you're not going to, the Quraysh from you is going to wither away. And so, no doubt, yani there's this sense that, oh my God, and so the birth of Abdullah showed them that it was a good omen. Remember we talked about many times I've said that Islam encourages good omens. I've said this many times. Islam encourages al-fa'al it's called. Al-fa'al is optimism and good omen. So the fact that Abdullah is born uh, basically essentially right when the Muslims are migrating and he was the first Muslim baby born in Medina. The first baby born in Medina after the Hijrah. So Abdullah marks essentially the beginning of a new era. And his birth was celebrated as a good omen. That this is a sign from Allah that we are now going to be blessed with children and, and, and what not. And, and so this was Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. Uh, getting back to the story of al-Zubayr. Al-Zubayr ibn Awam was a primary fighter in each and every battle of the process and without exception. He did not miss a single battle. He is one of the few who accompanied the Prophet ﷺ as his right-hand man in each and every battle. And if you look at Ibn Ishaq, you will find he did this in Badr, he did this in Uhud, he did this in, in Khandaq. Each one has, you know, in stories and snippets that, you know, he 
uh, was fighting with this person, he killed this person, and you know, if you want to be advanced, we can go and do all of that. But just to be very brief, what is interesting for us is in the Battle of Badr, uh, the Prophet chose him and Ali before the Battle of Badr to go check out the numbers of the Quraysh and make sure how much their army was. So Zubayr is chosen to be the one who does the scouting along with Ali ibn Talib, and he comes back and he tells the Prophet Sallallahu he was also one of the very few Sahaba who was on a horse in Badr. If you remember, Badr had hardly any horses from the side of the Muslims, right? Zubayr was one of the few people who had a horse, and in fact, this was a horse he brought with him from Mecca, so he had a horse with him from uh, Mecca. And he fought valiantly in the Battle of Badr, uh, and he was severely wounded. His son Urwa narrates in a famous narration mentioned in many books of hadith. His son Urwa says, I would play with the wounds on my father's body. A little child, he's saying, I would play with the wounds. And there were three of them I could poke my finger inside. So the body has a hole, and he can put a finger and the child is just playing with him. Three of these wounds were so severe that essentially, you know, there's something missing. And Urwa is said, two of those wounds were from Badr, and one of them was from Yarmouk, the Byzantine, the Romans. Two of them were from Badr, and one of them was from uh, Yarmouk. So this is in the Battle of Badr, that he was wounded so severely with a spear, with a javelin, that there was actually a hole in his body that... His son Urwa would just, as a child, play with and put his finger into it. He's saying, I have space to put my finger into that. It is also narrated in Abu Ya'la's Musnad that the Prophet wasallam saw a Zubair walking on the battlefield of Badr with a yellow turban wrapped around himself. Uh, Zubair had a yellow turban wrapped around. And the Prophet wasallam said, the angels have come to Badr in the same style as Zubair. So Zubair became the the, the yellow turbans essentially, all the angels came dressed like Zubayr ibn Awam. And that's an honor for Zubayr. It's an honor for Zubayr that the angels came down in the, in the garb, in the Z, in the, in the, in the manner of Zubayr ibn Awam. In the battle of Uhud, Zubayr narrates himself, Zubayr narrates himself that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offered his sword, you know the famous incident where he goes, who's going to take this sword from me? Right? And the first person to stand up was a Zubayr. Zubayr said, I will take it from you. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, who will take it from me? Meaning he wanted to overlook Zubayr in this time. Then who stood up? Who remembers the name? Abu Dujana. Abu Dujana stood up. And Abu Dujana said, I will take it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, take it with its right. And, and he said, what is its right? Its right is that you continue to use it and use it and use it until it breaks and you cannot use it anymore. So Abu Dujana took it. Zubair says, I felt something in my heart. Why didn't he give it to me? Because I wanted it. Because I thought I would take it. And because I was Ibn Ammati Safi, I'm his cousin. How could he not give me? Then he said, I'm going to follow Abu Dujana. So the story of Abu Dujana comes from Zubair. Because Zubair said, I'm going to follow Abu Dujana. Why did he get chosen and not me? And then he narrates, and I went over this in the Battle of Uhud. He narrates what Abu Dujana did. Then Zubair says, I understood why Abu Dujana was given the sword. Okay? So, Abu, so Zubair had a positive jealousy. There's nothing wrong with this jealousy. You should want to be blessed by Allah and His Messenger. He had a positive jealousy. A jealousy that is mustahab. This is the, the type of jealousy that you're supposed to have. And he wanted to have the sword. And uh, when he saw that Abu Dujana was given it, he realized that the Prophet had of course chosen the right uh, the right person. Uh, we also have a hadith in Sahih Bukhari that Urwa narrates from Aisha, the same is not Urwa from Aisha, right? Urwa narrates from Aisha that when Allah Azza wa revealed in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, verse 172, that the people who responded to Allah and His Messenger after they were wounded, there's an ayah in the Quran. Aisha says to her nephew Urwa, your father and my father Abu Bakr were of those regarding whom this ayah was revealed. Okay, so Aisha is now an elderly lady. She's speaking to her nephew Urwa and she's quoting a verse in the Quran that 
الذين استجابوا لله والرسول من بعد ما أصابهم القرح. These are the people who responded to the call of Allah and His Messenger after they were the, the calamity, the wounds, after all of the, 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 the issues happened with them. What is the story here? What is the story here? If you remember, remember when the Muslims returned from the battle of Uhud and they were all fatigued, tired, 70 plus people died. Trauma is affecting the whole ummah right now. What happened after that? Who remembers? So there was a fear that the Quraysh are going to redouble back. There is a fear that they're going to attack right now when the Muslims are the weakest. So even before the Muslims had time to even clean their wounds, they literally just got home and they're in complete shock and trauma. Immediately, the Prophet ﷺ said, I need another contingent. And now the Munafiqun volunteered. And the Prophet said, no, none of you, we don't want you ever. You're never going to fight with, well that ayah comes down later, but from now, we don't want you guys at all. You guys who betrayed us, you guys who walk back out of laziness, out of cowardice, now you're going to say you're interested? No. I only want the people who fought at Uhud. And he chose 70 of them who were still capable of attacking and fighting. And the two main ones were Ali and Zubair. At the forefront, Ali and Zubair. Right? And of course Abu Bakr is there. All so Aisha is saying, my father and your father are of those whom Allah said. They responded to the call of Allah and His Messenger after the calamity overtook them. So this is the battle of Uhud. The battle of Khaybar was when the highest honor that Zubayr ever received, he received it at Khaybar. Okay? The most famous mutawatir hadith. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. It's in every book of hadith. The most blessed, if you like, statement that is unique to Zubayr. Of course, Zubayr has other blessings. Zubayr is of the Ashram Mubashara. Zubayr has other blessings. But the one blessing that is unique to him and no other Sahabi has it, this occurs in the battle of Khaybar. In the battle, sorry, sorry, not Khaybar, Khandaq, Khandaq, not Khaybar, Khar, Khandaq. In the battle of Khandaq, I said Kha, the Kha became Khaybar, it's Khandaq. The battle of the trench. The battle of the trench. What happened in the battle of the trench? Remember, the Ahzab were around the city, 10,000 strong. And for one week, two weeks, three weeks, the supplies are dwindling. The Muslims don't know what to do. Situation is getting extremely bad. And then the worst thing that they could ever imagine happens, happens, and that is... The Banu Quraida from inside say, or they don't say, but it's clear that there's going to be treason. If the situation were as bad as imaginable, all of a sudden it got 100 times worse. Because how can you defend yourself against two fronts? How can you defend yourself against an inside enemy? Especially in this dire situation. And... This, when Allah, Allah describes in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah describes them, right? وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ right? وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ Your hearts were in your throats. Yani the Sahaba are described in this fact. Completely, they are now humans and they are terrified. We would probably have a heart attack and die. They are combating the fear. They're controlling the fear. But Allah describes them. وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ Even your thoughts began to think about Allah. ظُنُون You're thinking. هُنَالِكَ بَتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ This is where the believers were tested. وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا And they were shook a severe shaking. This is the Sahaba. Allah is talking about the Sahaba. That's how bad the situation was. It's wallahi difficult for us to imagine. Their food and their water was running low. Their supplies are almost over. They have 10,000 strong outside. There doesn't seem to be any hope of fighting. And on top of this, now the Banu Quraida from the inside are going to massacre the women and children. What is going to happen? So, the first night that the rumors spread that the Banu Quraida are going to renegade, are going to commit treason. And the Sahaba are, you can imagine how they're feeling. And that's why in one of the narrations I mentioned, uh, in one of the narrations I mentioned uh, when we did the Battle of Ahzab, that much later on, the Sahaba, one of the Tabi'un said, if I had been alive at the time of the Prophet he would have seen what I had done, what I would do. And the other one said, be quiet, sit down. You have no idea. For I remember a time in the Battle of Khandaq that the Prophet asked us 
to stand up and, and go and, and look at the, the Quraysh tribe, right? And not a single one of us stood up to do that. Like, what do you know what we had to face? Don't come 20 years later and say, oh, if I had been there, I would have done this. You have no clue. You don't know what the Sahaba had to undergo. So, at this point in time, the first night that the Banu Qurayla's treachery is revealed, so the Prophet ﷺ gathers the Sahaba and he said, who will go to the fortress of Banu Qurayla and verify, check, spy, are they rebelling or not? In the middle of the night, single-handedly, Somebody has to wander backwards, turn his back to the Quraysh and wander to a faraway you know, part where the Yahud used to live essentially and wander through many fields of, of date palms in the middle of the night and then make sure that he misses the guards and then wait and figure out from the distance does he feel that they're preparing for war or not. Immediately a Zubay stood up and said, Ana ya Rasulullah. So the process ignored him, he said, who will go? Because he doesn't want Zubayr to go. Who will go? Nobody says anything. Zubayr again says, Ana ya Rasulullah. For the third time, who will go? Nobody says anything. And Zubayr says, Ana ya Rasulullah. And at that point, the Prophet said the most famous hadith about Zubayr that is mutawatir about Zubayr. Inna li kulli nabiyin hawari. Every nabi has a hawari. What is a hawari? Hawari, it translates as a close disciple, as a, like what Allah uses to describe the disciples of Jesus, right? When Isa said to hawariyina, man ansari ilallah, qala al-hawariyuna, nahnu ansarullah. So the word hawari means essentially the close disciple who will do everything for the, for the master, for the owner, for the, or for the, um, uh, for the Nabi in this case, right? Uh, for the Prophet in this case. So the Prophet said, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ حَوَارِي Every Nabi, he has a Hawari. And the Hawari of this Ummah, my Hawari, is Az-Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. Okay? So there's no other Sahabi that has been called Hawari. No Sahabi. Zubair is the Hawari of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is mutawatir and it was said at this point in time when basically nobody is volunteering other than Zubair uh, multiple times. And by the way, so Zubair did go and Zubair came back and he said, they have gathered up their sheep and they're saddling their horses. Clear cut. Their sheep outside, inside the fortress, which means they don't want to, they want them to be protected. And they're saddling their horses. And you don't saddle the horses in the middle of the night. You don't saddle the horses in the middle of the night. You so Zubayr stood there. We don't know the details. We're reading this in. But clearly, he bravely monitored the activities from a distance. And Allah knows best in the middle of the night how he did it. He got this information back and he said, yes, they have renegade. They have rebelled. They have committed treason. So this is Zubayr ibn Awam. And... That's when the Prophet said to him, when, uh, when, uh, when he came back, the Prophet said something else to him. Uh, he said the Hawari when he uh, volunteered. When he came back and he gave him the news, the Prophet gave him another phrase, which it's not unique to Zubayr. As far as we know, it is given to only one more Sahabi. So only two Sahaba have ever had this phrase said to them. Okay, so Zubayr in this case is with another Sahabi. So when Zubayr came and said, Ya Rasulullah, they have done this and this and this. So the Prophet said to him, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi. Okay, now that phrase has only been said to one more person. And that is Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas in the battle of Uhud. When the Prophet was being protected and Sa'd was doing the arrows and whatnot. And the Prophet said, Irmi ya Sa'id fidaka abi wa ummi. And Abu Bakr said, I never felt jealous of anybody except on that day for Sa'id. Because he never combined between abi wa ummi except on that day. Now, Sa'id ibn Abi Waqas, frankly, he is the one whom more people know that the Prophet said, Fidaka abi wa ummi. But Zubair, it was said at this occasion. And what does Fidaka abi wa ummi mean? It's actually an expression. The linguistic meaning is not intended. 
It's like an expression, you know, in English we say he was caught red-handed. Doesn't mean his hand was actually red. The point is, there's an expression. The expression translates as, literally it translates as, May my mother and father be given to save you for your ransom. May my mother and father be given for your ransom. Right? That, and the point here, that, that essentially, and by the way, this phrase was the common way that the Sahaba would talk to the Prophet ﷺ. It was very common. The Sahaba would always say, Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. Fidaka abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. This is well known. All the Sahaba would say this to the Prophet ﷺ because this is the highest way to demonstrate loyalty. Essentially what you're saying, you know it's easy to give yourself for somebody. To say, I'll give my mother and father for you. Who is worthy to have, to have that said to other than Rasulullah Sallallahu Who else is there that you can say such a high thing to? Now again, it's a figure of speech. It's not as if they're going to do this, right? It's a fi- now, of course, for Rasulullah Sallallahu we do it. But I'm saying for anybody else, you don't actually do it. It's just a figure of speech. The Prophet Sallallahu never said it in his whole life except twice. Once to Sa'd, and uh, the point is when you say it, you're elevating the person's rank. You understand, you clearly understand. Think about it, when you say this phrase, you're taking this person, you're raising him to the highest level. That's the highest phrase to honor somebody. Fidaka abi wa ummi. So only two Sahaba ever had this said to them. And that is Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas at the Battle of Uhud. And this is the more famous one. And that is why, for example, we have Ali and others. They said that the Prophet never he never combined his parents, meaning Fidaka Abu Ummi, except for Sa'ad. Ali said this, radiallahu anh, but that's because he didn't know of this second time. So Ali is saying, basically, I never heard him do that. And that's correct, he never heard him do that. But other Sahaba narrated that the Prophet said, Fidaka Abu Ummi to Zubair on the day of uh, Khandaq when the treachery of the Banu Quraidah was discovered. So this is um, the uh, Banu uh, Quraidah incident uh, in the battle of the uh, Khandaq. Uh, in the battle of Khaybar as well, we have uh, an incident that is narrated from uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Ishaq as well, and that is that in one of the battles of Khaybar, Khaybar lasted 40 days, remember? Khaybar, the Yahudi uh, camps where there were many fortresses, and each fortress was a mini battle, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. So there's a series of battles taking place. And in one particular battle, there was a, essentially a giant amongst the Yehud. I mean, you know, a muscular, like a warrior amongst the Yehud, who was killing and injuring and maiming people left and right. And he was challenging, who's going to come, who's going to come? And eventually, nobody answered the call, because he would get rid of everybody. And that is when Zubair stood up and said, I'm going to come. So Zubair stood up to take on uh, this, uh, this warrior, this giant, and Safiya cried out, Ya Rasulullah, he's going to kill my son. He's the mother. Safiya cried out, Ya Rasulullah, stop him. He's going to kill my son. And the Prophet said, La, no. Bel yaqtuluhu Zubair. Zubair is going to kill him, not the other way around. Right? No, it's not going to happen. Rather, Zubair is going to kill him. And that's what happened. Zubair was the one who finally got rid of this, uh, this warrior on the, the, the battle of uh, Khaybar. So as we said, Zubair clearly is one of the main physical warriors. His body, his strength, his agility, all of this was demonstrated multiple uh, times. And in the conquest of Mecca, Zubair was one of the three people whom the Prophet gave the banners to, the rayat. So he's a flag bearer. And therefore, it is true to say that Zubair becomes one of the most honorable flag bearers in the history of Islam. Because what city is being conquered? Mecca. So he becomes the flag bearer, like the symbol of Islam. When Mecca is being conquered, one of the three people who is carrying, and each one was on a different side, right? So Zubair is all alone where he is, and then there was Khalid and Walid, and then there was one of the Ansar. So there are three people carrying the flag, and Zubair was one of the people whom the Prophet gave the flag to as they enter uh, the, the conquest of the city of Mecca. So quite literally, he becomes one of the most prestigious flag standard bearers in the entire history of our religion of Islam because of the circumstances of the conquest of Mecca. After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, Zubair obviously becomes one of the closest advisors to Abu Bakr and Umar. He's one of the Ahl al-Shura. He's one of the Ahl al-Halli wal-Aqt. He's the inner circle. He's of the viziers, meaning he is 
there is no official vizier, you understand, there's no MPs and senators, but Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, they had an inner core circle. They would consult. Zubair was of that circle of Abu Bakr and of Umar. In the uh, reign of Abu Bakr and Umar, he participated in a number of wars. Uh, and in fact, he played a decisive role in the Battle of Yarmouk. The Battle of Yarmouk, if you remember, was the most significant battle of early Islam. Uh, it opened the door for all the Byzantine conquests, right? It was the first major battle that the Muslims had against the Romans, the Byzantines. And Zubayr ibn al-Awwam was the senior most Sahabi who was participating in Yarmouk. So in terms of rank, he is the senior most Sahabi. In terms of uh, yani the, the, the conversion to Islam, he is the earliest convert to Islam, who is now participating in Yarmouk. So because of this, the Sahaba took him as a good omen. And they rallied around him, believing that Allah is going to bless, yani basically, the army through his fighting and whatnot. And that's exactly what happened. That um, uh, Zubayr al awwam was severely wounded. Remember, Urwa said, I would play with his body with three wounds. One of them was from Yarmouk. So Zubair, Zubair was severely wounded, but he recovered from those wounds and he came back to Medina and he recuperated. Within a few years, Amr ibn al-As is conquering Egypt. And he entered with how many men? All the Muslims you know. How many men did he enter Egypt with? 4,000. 4,000 men. He entered with 4,000 men. And those 4,000 were overwhelmed in Iskandariya. He emails back, not emails, he mails back, we need reinforcements. Send people. So Umar ibn al-Khattab sends a contingent led by Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. One of the, now by this time he's pretty old, he's in his 50s, but still it's his prestige. The fact that people cheer up and they take him as a good omen. So sending Zubayr ibn al-Awwam is essentially a morale booster. So he sends Zubayr ibn al-Awwam with a few thousand, they say maybe even 10,000, a large group went. But Zubayr is basically one of the uh, commanders of the, of the army. And in fact, he actually fought a very, very vicious, ferocious battle. And it is mentioned in the books of history that he played a pivotal role in conquering one of the most difficult Roman fortresses. Remember, Egypt at the time is under Roman territory, under Roman rule. And the Romans had fortified Egypt with, so essentially the way they would do this, they would build fortress towns. Before you could get to civili civilization and civilian towns, they would have many, uh, if you like, army bases, call them army bases, essentially they're army bases, right? They are entire fortresses of nothing but soldiers. And the point of these fortresses, if the invading army comes, then this is, you have to fight them before you go inside. So one of the most difficult fortresses was a fortress that had been built almost a thousand years ago, initially by the Persians and then by the uh, Romans that had been fortified multiple times. And it was called the Fortress of Babylon. And from what I understand, there are still remnants of this fortress still standing. Uh, it is now, it is now in a suburb of Cairo, but there was no Cairo when this is taking place, right? When this is taking place, there is no Cairo. The city of Qahira was built by the Fatimids. The city of Qahira is not something that um, uh, was there. At this point in time, it is simply a garrison fortress. That's all it is. And this is the, this is the kernel of the city of Qahira that's eventually going to become. This fortress is what eventually Qahira is built around. This fortress the Muslims had surrounded it for seven months without any hope. That's how powerful it was. They're laying siege to the fortress and nothing is happening. For seven months, stalemate. And the person who broke the stalemate was Zubayr ibn Awam. Zubayr ibn Awam. And his story is absolutely amazing. What, and again, we only know tidbits of it. He led a small group of people to scale the walls of the fortress and to jump inside the fortress and essentially fight off and kill the guards to open up the doors. Now, you know, you see this in the movies, you see this, these types of stuff, you know, and you really cannot believe how do people do this? Like they scale up the walls, they jump down inside, they're surrounded by, by the enemy. This is Zubair leading the charge at his age. And he then opens up the fortress and then 
uh, the Muslims come in and then of course the fortress is conquered, right? So Zubayr ibn Awam is instrumental in opening the doors for the conquest of Egypt as well from this, uh, the Babylon uh, fortress. And Zubair then returns back to Medina after helping uh, Umar ibn As conquer much of, uh, of, of Egypt. He then returns back to um, Medina and um, he at the death of Uthman, uh, the death of Umar radiallahu anhu, he is nominated in the Shura and in the Shura as you know Abdul Rahman ibn Auf says, who amongst you will give up their position to somebody else? So Zubair is immediately the one who says, I'm not interested, hand it over to Ali. So Zubair gets out. He's not interested in politics and power. He doesn't want to be in charge. So he says, give my position to Ali, I'm out of here. So Zubair ibn Awam was not involved in uh, siyasa in this regard, right? Now interestingly, he gives it to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And yet what's going to happen in four years? He's going to be on the other side, right? And this shows you, subhanAllah, any things change in this nature. So he gave his vote to Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he then basically, uh, obviously, Uthman radiallahu anhu was, uh, was uh, chosen to be the Khalifa. And uh, in the siege of Uthman, Zubair uh, did not participate at all. Unlike Talha, who might have had a little bit, Zubair was completely neutral. But then when Uthman was massacred, he felt an immense sense of guilt that he didn't do more to protect Uthman. Not that he did anything against, but he didn't, like he didn't do anything to, to basically help. Now remember we explained why they didn't do anything, because Uthman had told them not to do anything. That's why they didn't do anything. And nobody thought it would get to that level. Nonetheless, Zubair felt extremely guilty that he had not done anything, and eventually Talha and Zubair, and they were always close to one another, uh, Talha and Zubair, they decided to leave for Mecca, meet up with Aisha, Hook, uh, connect with the, the network of people that were angry at the death of Uthman and then march to Basra and then the battle of Jamal, the battle of camel takes place, right? We talked about the battle of the camel and it was on the battle of the camel that the two main figures and stars were Talha and Zubair on that side and uh, messages upon messages came to both Talha and Zubair to don't do this and eventually the both of them agreed Talha, as we explained when we talked about him, he stayed on his horse and he was riding back and forth telling the people, okay, let's put your arms back, put your swords back in, and that's when he was shot. As for Zubair, his death is even more tragic. We all know he died on the Battle of Jamal, I've done this ten times now. His death is even more tragic. He actually left the battlefield. So technically he should not have been killed. We can understand understand, nobody justifying, The Talha is on the battlefield, he's on his horse, people from the other side are seeing him running up and down, so they target him. We can understand that. But Zubair was killed in a technically illegal fashion. It's a very low thing to do. And what happened was that both Ibn Abbas and Ali ibn Abi Talib, they told Zubair, stop, leave. And Ali said to him, do not do this, you know, don't fight me. And Ibn Abbas said to him, uh, and Ibn Abbas physically said, Ali sent a messenger. Ibn Abbas said to him, what would your mother Safiya do if she saw you fighting against Ali? Because Ali is the... Cousin of, of Zubair. Ali is the cousin of Zubair, so uh, Safiya is the aunt as well. Safiya is the aunt, right? So what would your mother say if she saw you fighting against against Ali. And so, and he basically, Zubair said, he agreed that, you know what, we shouldn't be doing this. If it's going to lead to war, forget about it. So, he literally left the battlefield and this was when uh, a very low, um, what words we can use for him, whatever you want to use, but uh, a person whom even Ali and Ibn Abbas and others said, you are a person of Jahannam. They told him, the one who killed Ibn Safiya. And there's a daif hadith, qatilu Ibn Safiya fin nar. There's a daif hadith, but this is not from the Prophet this is actually from the Sahaba. The Sahaba said this, Ibn Abbas said this, Ali said this, the one who kills Ibn al Safiya is in the fire of hell. The one who kills the son of Safiya, the son of Safiya is Zubair. Zubair, the son of Safiya. Qatil ibn Safiya fin nar. So uh, a person by the name of Amr ibn Jarmuz, Amr ibn Jarmuz was the one who saw Zubair leave the battlefield and he felt a sense of rage, like you're not going to leave without suffering for causing us to come together. So he followed Zubair and he killed him essentially 
essentially without a, a, a battle. Like he didn't ask him to draw swords. He killed him a cowardly death. When he should, meaning he's a coward. Ibn Jarmuz is a coward. You don't kill people like this. We understand, not, nobody's justifying. When a war is taking place, we understand death is going to happen. Zubair was not on the battlefield. He was followed by Ibn Jarmuz and he was killed outside the battlefield. Essentially, some say he was praying, some say he was, basically his back was turned to Ibn Jarmuz. Ibn Jarmuz came and put the javelin into him and killed him. Now, uh, obviously, this is, this is not at all something that is allowed in our religion. And when Ali ibn Abi Talib heard of this, uh, and Ibn Jarmuz came to him to boast that I killed, that I killed uh, Zubair, uh, Ali refused to see him, and he said, go tell him that uh, he is going to be in Jahannam. Qatul ibn Sabiya fin nar. This person is going to be in Jahannam for doing what he did. Now it is also mentioned that on that day, on that day, Zubair turned to his son Abdullah, and said to him, that today a lot of people will die, some of them will be zalim, some of them will be mazloom. And I am certain that my death will also happen today. So he senses it. I am certain my death will happen today. And then he leaves Abdullah, his son, a long wasiyah, which is recorded in many books, and I'm not going to go over all of it, but it's essentially making sure that his debts are paid off, and making sure that so-and-so is taken care of and give my money to so-and-so. So essentially he's taking care of his worldly um, matters and he emphasizes over and over again, return all of my debts, make sure all of my debts and my amanat are paid off. And in case you don't have the funds to pay off my amana, then ask my master, and he uses the word master that slaves use, ask my master to help you pay off the debts. So Abdullah said, who is your master? Because that's a word that slaves use. Who is your mawla? Mawla is your... So he said, Allah is my mawla. Allah is my mawla. And whenever you don't have the funds to pay my debts, say, O mawla of Zubair, pay the debts of Zubair off. For every time I have ever been in difficulty and I don't have any money to pay off my debts, this is the dua I make. Ya Mawla Zubair. Iqdid Dayna an Zubair. Get rid of the loans that I have from Zubair. Now, why did Zubair have so many loans or so many amanat? The books mention some interesting facts here. So pause here. We need to explain the economic situation. These days we have banks. And that's a problem in and of itself. When we didn't have banks and you're earning money, and money, and money, and money, even a middle class person, what do you do with that money? You don't want to keep it at home, especially if you have enemies or thieves or whatnot. What do you do? What they would do is they would go to a very prestigious, trustworthy person, like our process in the days of Mecca. And they would store their funds with this person. That this person is too prestigious, too respected, and he's trustworthy. So they would store their funds with somebody like this. And then whenever they need it, they would come and they would collect it. Right? So essentially, people do this as a... And it's an honor for them that I am so trustworthy that people leave their stuff with me. Remember the process I'm in, in the hijrah? Remember, he had to return the wada'ir. That's what it's called, right? So essentially, Zubair is of that stature that he has quite literally hundreds of thousands, i.e. hundreds of hundreds of thousands, like millions of these types of peep, of wealth, of coins and whatnot. But Zubair would have a condition. And he would say, I'm not going to keep it in my house. I'm not going to store your actual money. Take it on my credit that I will pay you back and then what do you think he did with the money? Invest. Give it to the needy. Give it to the fuqara. And he would trust in Allah that he would get the money to pay the people back. He would trust in Allah that I'll get the funds I need and I'll be able to pay them back. And subhanAllah for his entire life he would do that. That Allah Azza wa would bless him and he would be able to pay it back. And there are many books that mention he would get so much wealth and not a single penny would go inside of his house. It would not enter his house. He would not want to sleep with 
bags of gold and silver and whatnot. So he would keep it on his shoulders, his, his, his responsibility that inshallah is going to be paid back. So he's telling his sons that, Abdullah in particular, that when these people come to collect their money, you will find a way and just make dua to Allah that, O Mawla of Zubair, get rid of my dain, get rid of my uh, wada and my, my responsibilities. And subhanAllah, that's exactly what happened, that slowly but surely, People came and they started demanding, started demanding, started demanding, we gave this, we gave this, we gave this. And Abdullah ibn Zubair, and the story goes on, and he basically uh, uh, was in, under a lot of pressure. And a number of Sahaba came forth and they helped and did this and that until finally, uh, what was apparently people obviously owed him money as well. So he would give money as a loan from himself. So essentially, the amount that came back was much more than the amount that was owed. And eventually, even though his sons did not know this, he actually left a mini fortune for them. Or I should say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Zubair, that even though he didn't live the lifestyle, even though nobody knew this about him, essentially what was owed to him was so much more that every one of his wives and children was left with a mini fortune. A comfortable amount, even though nobody knew that this was how much money he actually had. Because realize, by the way, so because Zubair was the first batch of converts, remember, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, what are they doing? They're giving a stipend, a salary, and what was the pay grade? You know, your companies have level 20 and level 17 and level 14. What was the pay grade back then? Oldest. And who is the oldest convert to Islam? It is now Zubair. So essentially Zubair is getting many fortunes which nobody knows about because all of it is going back to the Dain or Faqir or something. And then when he passes away, Allah's blessings come and show in his progeny and his children, right? And this is Allah Azza's way of blessing the people back. So his essentially his children inherit a fortune even though they didn't even know their father had it. And this is the blessing of Zubayr ibn Awam. So Zubayr, of course, passes away, uh, dies in the Battle of Jamal, 36 um, AH. And uh, he is buried uh, uh, in the same place that he is passed away. And there's ikhtilaf about whether his burial is known or not. But he must be buried in the vicinity, essentially, of uh, Kufa. Uh, and very quickly, time is coming up now. Uh, Zubayr ibn Awam, uh, he married at least eight women in the course of his life. Uh, his most important and his most famous wife was his first wife, and that is Asma binti Abi Bakr. Asma binti Abi Bakr, she will inshallah have her own halaqa, her own story inshallah. And she is, of course, the older sister of Aisha radiallahu anha from a different mother. From a different mother. And Asma binti Abi Bakr, she narrates many, many hadith. One of them is interesting for us here. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Asma basically says, I married Zubair and he didn't own anything. He was dirt poor. And all that he had was a plot of land that was yani, uh, farsakh away. That's like basically a you know, few, uh, two hour walk or something. You're going to have to go and get it. And he would go and do his work. And I would go and you know, harvest and, and get some of the dates from that. And then walk back home. Right? From that small plot of land that was so far away that he had. Of course, this is in the beginning of uh, Medina. Right? The beginning of Medina. And... One day, I was coming back with the dates, uh, the dates on my head. She's carrying the basket of dates on my head, right? Or the pit stones on my head. And the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba were coming back from some chore or something, and they were on their camels and horses. And the Prophet ﷺ recognized me as a sister-in-law. And of course, Medina is like an hour away, right? So the Prophet ﷺ pulled his camel up to me, and told Aswa to sit down and made a motion that come sit on the back. Like, you're not going to walk so far away. I'll take you all the way back there, right to Medina. So, Asma says, I was about to sit. Then I remembered the ghira of Zubair. Zubair was a very... What did you say, ghira? Like, yani. What if he felt something that I'm sitting on a camel with the Prophet ﷺ, right? So, istahiyat, I, I, I became embarrassed. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed that I'm embarrassed, so he continued on, he made the camel go up and he continued on, 
right? So she didn't get onto the camel uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu And then I, when I went back, I told Zubair all that had happened. That, you know, I didn't go on because I was worried about your ghir and whatnot. So he said, Wallahi, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ saw you carrying the pit stones on your head is a far greater embarrassment for me than if you sat with him. Meaning, you know, every man, Wallahi, every man understands. This is a very difficult thing, you know, to see you're struggling in this fashion and we're so dirt poor that this is, this is also an embarrassment for me, that you have to be doing this menial uh, labor. And uh, when Abu Bakr heard that Asma was in such difficult circumstances, so he gifted Asma a servant, yani a slave, right? And Asma says, it was as if that was the day I achieved my freedom from slavery. <laughs> Housewives, mothers, we feel your pain. <laughs> Asma called being a housewife a slave. You can quote this, sisters, huh? Brothers, don't blame me. I'm just quoting the hadith here. Don't look at me, okay? Just move on. Don't, don't talk about this. She literally called being a housewife in this Mashan manner a slave. And every mother and wife knows exactly what, how difficult that is. And she said, when he gave me a slave, يعني, I achieved freedom on the day that I got that from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Now, subhanAllah, one has to comment here that subhanAllah, Look at how they began their lives and look at how they ended their lives. This is also the sunnah of Allah fi khalq. It is also Allah Azza wa Jal's yani sunnah. Uh, in any case, uh, Asma binti Abi Bakr was the main uh, wife and many children uh, and, and the most famous children. And that is Abdullah and Urwa. And there are others as well. We're not going to go over all 20 names, don't worry. Uh, he had 20 children at least. 20 children at least, 11 sons and 9 daughters, 11 sons and 9 daughters. Um, eventually, things did not work out between them, and many, many years later, after the death of the Prophet uh, he ended up divorcing uh, Asma. And this also shows us that, subhanAllah, you know, sometimes this is Zubayr, this is Asma, and they are who they are, but they didn't get along in a marriage. So going through a divorce doesn't mean that you're a bad person, doesn't mean your Iman or Akhlaq is bad. This is Zubair, this is Asma, and they are both of the elite of the Sahaba. But their differences just were not... And, and after some time of marriage, and it, they, they were married, um, Allah is difficult to estimate, but it must be at least 13, 14 years, 15 years, at least minimum. They were married for a good period of time. It just didn't work out between them. Eventually they part their ways and they go their separate ways. And this also shows us, as I said, that divorces and the way they looked at divorce is different than the way we looked at it as well. It wasn't like the end all, it wasn't like the end of life for them. It's just a part of life and then you move on. Uh, uh, he had, uh, as we said, at least uh, seven other wives. Uh, we'll only mention one more that was of some significance for us at this level. Advanced students can go to more than this. And that is uh, the other wife that uh, is of some importance for our purposes is Atika binti, Atika binti Zaid. And this is the sister of Sa'id ibn Zayd, who is one of the ten as well. Sa'id ibn Zayd is one of the ten promised Jannah. And this is Atika, the sister of Sa'id. And uh, she is the daughter of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, the famous Hanif before Islam. So this is Zayd ibn Amr ibn his daughter is Atika. Now Atika, she was married uh, to uh, a Sahabi by the name of Ubaidillah who died uh, at the death of a Shaheed uh, very early on in, in Medina. Uh, then she married Umar ibn Khattab, Atika, and Umar died the death of a Shaheed, as you know. Then she married Zubair, then Zubair died the death of a Shaheed, so that's three Shaheeds. Okay? So then the news became that whoever wants to become a Shaheed, <laughs> what should he do? Marry Atika. Marry Atika. Right? So Ali radiallahu an proposed to Atika. And Atika said, No, I don't want you to die the death of a shaheed. But he still died the death of a shaheed. <laughs> so we don't base our, uh, our, our, our qadr and whatnot. And you cannot go around al qadr. Atika said no to Ali because she said, So she kind of also began to believe this that whoever I marry is going to die a shaheed. So she said no to Ali, and she didn't marry anybody else because she felt that yani, 
whoever I marry, she's gonna he's gonna die the death of a shaheed, right? So she said no to Ali, and what happened to Ali radiallahu an? He dies the death of a shaheed, right? So this shows us as well that uh, uh, yeah, and it's not going to, you know, it doesn't matter. Allah's qadr is Allah's qadr. Um, and then the final point, inshallah, and this, with this we conclude, um, that um, uh, Zubayr ibn Awam, as we said, he had 11 sons and 9 daughters. And Zubayr had a philosophy of naming his children. He named all 11 sons, without exception, after various shaheeds of the Sahaba. Every one of them, right? And uh, the whole list, of, and you can literally go over Ibn Sa'd and his tabaqat. Ibn Sa'd and his tabaqat, he mentions all 11, and he says, this is named after so-and-so. So he, Mus'ab, for example, Mus'ab, Mus'ab, Hamza, one of his sons, right? Ubaidillah, he has this, uh, Sa'd from uh, Sa'd ibn um, uh, the Ansari, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. So every one of them he's naming, right? After some of the shaheeds, he's naming them. So everyone is named after Shaheed. Now, who can remember from last week, what did Talha used to do? Talha would name his children after the Prophet. So one day, Talha began to have a conversation with Zubair. What is it that you're naming your sons after Shaheeds? Look at me. I'm naming them after Prophet, so he's trying to like, I mean, you know, this is friendly brotherliness. It's like, you know, teasing between, they were very close friends, right? So he's saying, look, I mean, follow my sunnah here. We're giving some, some upgrade. We're getting to the prophets, right? So look at Zubair's response. Look at the, the trump card here, right? What does he say? Zubair says, well, my, my sons can aspire to be shaheeds. Your sons can never be prophets. You're not going to win here, okay? So I'm gonna, I can inspire them to get this level. Your level is beyond hope for them, right? So subhanAllah, look at this camaraderie and brotherliness between them. Uh, and of course, um, Abdullah did die the death of a shaheed, and more than one of his children died the death of a shaheed. Very, very uh, quickly, subhanAllah, time is almost up. Uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed, as we always do, some very quick hadith of Zubayr ibn Awam. Zubayr ibn Awam has very, very few hadith, less than six or seven hadith. Why? Well. Actually, we don't have time to go into all of them, but I will quote uh, one of the one of the hadith. Okay, so this is Muslim Imam Ahmad, and we have uh, Muhammad Jaffar from Shu'ba, from, Shu from Jamia Shaddad, from Amir ibn Abdullah ibn Zubair, from his father, from his grandfather. He said, "Mali la asma'uka tuhadithu an Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam kama asma'u ibn Mas'ud wa fulan wa fulan." Oh Father, why don't you narrate from the Prophet Sallallahu like I hear Ibn Mas'ud and so and so and so and so. Why don't you have the same number of hadith? So what is the statement of Zubayr ibn Awam? Zubayr ibn Awam said, said أَمَّا إِنِّي لَمْ أُفَارِقُ مُنذُ أَسْلَمْتْ I never was away from the Prophet since I accepted Islam. But I heard one kalima, it stopped me from narrating a hadith. And what is it? مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever narrates anything wrong about me, let him be prepared to be in the Jahannam. So from, in this hadith uh, intentionally, from this hadith he became so cautious that he essentially said that I am never going to narrate any more uh, any more a hadith, and so he literally has only uh, five or six a hadith, and these are all primarily uh, repetitions. Uh, and uh, we have over here uh, one of them that uh, 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 again that I'll do is Wan um, Abdullah Zubair. He said that on the day of Ahzab, I uh, was uh, Abdullah bin Zubair says that on the day of Ahzab, I was put with Umar ibn Abi Salama uh, to guard. Uh, over uh, over the women, Abdullah ibn Zubair. So I said, I saw Zubair go towards the Bani Quraidah and come back and go and come back and go and come back. So I said to my father, this is Abdullah ibn Zubair, I said to my father, Ya Abati, oh my father, what is the matter with you that you are going and coming over there? So Zubair said, did you see me leave and come? He said, yes, I did. So he said, it was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said to me, who will bring me the news of Bani Quraida and their moving abouts. So I was the one who volunteered. And when I came back, I heard the Prophet say, 
Fidaka abi wa ummi to me. So this is Zubair telling his son. Because you know you tell your son these things, you make them. This is Zubair telling Abdullah ibn Zubair that the Prophet said this uh, to me. Um, and one more, uh, one more hadith that I wanted to uh, mention over here. Uh, and I cannot... Ah, yes, here it is. Okay. Uh, it is the hadith... It is the hadith of him mentioning the blessings of Talha. So Zubair is mentioning the blessings of Talha. So Zubair is saying that on the day of Uhud, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say about Talha that Aujaba Talha. Talha has achieved Jannah, and that was when Talha lowered his back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet, remember, we talked about this last week. And the Prophet got on his back and then uh, climbed over the rock. So Zubair is talking about the blessings of Talha and he's telling his children uh, and again this is Abdullah ibn Zubair so he's basically telling his son so almost all of the ahadith of Zubair come through Abdullah and he's talking and having a conversation uh, with his son and uh, he also has over here I'm not going to go over it uh, the story of Safiya as well that uh, Zubair mentions uh, Safiya wanting to see the body of Hamza and Zubair stopping her and Safiya pushing him out. He mentions this in one of those as well. Essentially, this is really all that we have, just three or four narrations from Zubair, and that's about it. One of the smallest chapters of hadith in the Musnad of Imam um, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we come to the conclusion of today's. And inshallah, next week we'll continue with the rest of the Ashara Mubashara.